My name is Monk Rowe and we are in Emerson, New Jersey. I'm very pleased to be speaking with Sonny Igo today for the Jazz Archive at oh, Hamilton thank College. Thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a real pleasure to be here amongst your memorabilia. Well, I told you it would be a mess. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I see a, a rather large drumstick oh, back yes, there. Is yes, that spe sure. special for students who don't well, like Well, you would their think I could, I could really club them with this, wouldn't you? <laughs> but this was from a a store that went out of business in New York called Professional Percussion, and uh, they, uh, one of the fellows who worked there was taking lessons with me, so he brought me I see. the, I don't know what happened to the other one, maybe right. I broke it on somebody, I don't know, <laughs> <laughs> but that's it. Yeah, well, we were just, uh, before we started here, you were talking about some of your early gigs with a good friend of Hamilton, actually, Bucky Pizzarelli. Ah. Yeah, he's been up to the college a number of times, and... Oh, he's uh, great for that. Yeah. yeah. And I like the stories about those four dollar gigs. Oh you know, yeah, that's if, all if we you made. Don't mind, if you don't mind just relating that sure. to some of those when wedding we were, gigs. When we were kids coming up in so-called music, we were still in high school. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, there was no rock and roll or pop music as they know it today. It was all jazz and big bands, dance bands, you know, like Vaughn Monroe, Jimmy Dorsey, Tommy Dorsey, Benny Goodman. Mm -hmm. They were primarily, they were jazz players, but they were primarily dance bands. And uh, people danced to the music. And um, uh, so we were uh, in high school, when we were in high school, he was in uh, Patterson, I was in Ridgewood. We didn't, our paths didn't cross yet. And uh, I played with a band called Harry Comet. And jokingly, we called it Harry Comet and his meteorites. Uh -huh. And uh, when we played a job, we made uh, five dollars. And if we played a job on New Year's Eve, we might have made twelve mm. for New Year's Eve. You know, that was boy back then. That was big money. 1938, 1939. Uh -huh. Nobody had any money. We just the depression wasn't even over yet. And uh, that's the way we learned how to play, by playing all kinds of jobs. Now, I think you were referring to the job about the weddings. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, Bucky and I were playing an Italian wedding at a place called the Lafayette Friends Club in uh, uh, East Patterson. And uh, I played there a lot, he played there a lot. Sometimes we played together there. And this time we did. And I forget whose band it was. Anyway, um, in those days, the weddings were not glamorous like they are today. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the caterer was a man who brought in barrels of sandwiches wrapped, and if somebody wanted a ham on rye, they'd throw it, or throw me a turkey, or a roast beef, or whatever, and the booze was just keg beer, and everybody had a marvelous time. Everybody was dancing and having a marvelous time. And uh, on this particular night, <laughs> I can remember, I can remember it still very clearly. We're playing along, and all of a sudden, these people start coming on the stage from both sides. And they were all Bucky's relatives, his grandfather, his uncles, his cousins, and they all could play guitar or mandolin or something like that. So we did about a half an hour of, of um, Italian wedding stuff, you know. And they loved it. It was just something else. And then they all disappeared. Nobody got paid. They just showed up and <laughs> yeah. played and left. And that was so that's the way it was back then. That's cool. And I think we might have gotten four dollars uh -huh. for that job. Yeah. And what else would have been on your song list? Like oh, uh, well, if you Ellington playing, stuff? Oh, you know, sure. You played, uh, back then, you couldn't play in a band uh, a horn uh, uh, unless you were just jamming in a club uh, without being able to read music because they passed out what they called stock arrangements. Right. Now they had these stock arrangements where you get all the Glenn Miller stuff, like In the Mood, a Little mm -hmm. brown, brown Jug and all that, Tommy Dorsey stuff, Benny Goodman stuff, and you play all that because that was the popular stuff on the radio. And that's what people expected to uh, mm -hmm. dance to when you played it. So you go da da dee da doo dee da do do you know, and everybody gets up and dances. Would there have been a, a singer? Oh yes, mm -hmm. usually a guy, but sometimes a girl. And um, it was just, it was set up as like we were supposed to be kind of like an imitation name band, so to uh -huh. speak, you know, okay. a low, yeah. low budget name band. Right. I don't know, I, uh, I really, you know, I had so much fun doing that and I thought we were good, you know, mm -hmm. but I was so naive. I thought everybody thought I was a good drummer when I was a kid, but, <laughs> but apparently that was not the case. Really? <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> you know, I had this thing about, gee, well, I could play. I had a lot of stuff that Gene Cooper played, memorized, you know, and mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. And uh, he was my idol when I was a kid. 
So I uh, would play some of that stuff. I said, well, everybody would love that, you know. But that, and then so guys would say, you know, everybody doesn't play like Gene Krupa, so I think, you know. So. Uh -huh. <laughs> Didn't you win a Gene Krupa contest? Yes, something? I did. That's why I'm, <laughs> that's what I'm leading up to. Yeah. Well, I was very, you know, I always say, well, I was lucky because uh, I was only 16. P publicity came out that Gene was going to uh, give have a drum contest for amateur drummers, kids. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you called up and... Uh, talk to the people at the Meadowbrook or whoever uh, and uh, I uh, called up or my mother called up I guess and uh, no it's my grandmother called up because she, she lived in East Orange and she heard about it she uh -huh. called up and told them about me <laughs> so they took our number and they they called us and we we came uh, uh, we went that afternoon and uh, there were about uh, 40 drummers oh. and they were we were set up on the dance floor at the Meadowbrook and Gene didn't know how to handle it quite because uh, the, it's the first time he did that. He didn't expect that many guys to begin with. And the majority of the fellas came with uh, these very glamorous sets just like Gene's, you know. And I had a junkie. I had a terrible So oh, As a matter of fact, half of it was in this picture here where you really can't see much. But look how old-fashioned that is. <laughs> That is really old fashioned uh -huh. with the temple blocks and the tom toms that you sure. can't tune. Those are called Chinese tom toms, oh. you know. Uh -huh. And uh, did I was you about have that age. Did you have a hi hat? Yes, I right see. over here. See this great big uh, thing here? Yeah. Yeah. That's what they called a hi hat in those days. Those symbols were awful, they were just terrible. But oh. anyway, that's what, that's what my set looked I'm like. I'm so glad that, look at you, you have the. I put, chair a, I had a to put, yeah, put a pillow <laughs> so I could sit high enough. That's great. You know, they didn't have any, I didn't have a kitchen stool or something. Uh -huh. anyway. anyway, but that's, that's what neat. my set was the pits. Uh -huh. You know, everybody else had great drums, you know. So anyway, we, uh, I had had uh, the good fortune to have met a fellow named Joe Mooney, who was a marvelous mm -hmm. musician from Patterson. He was blind. He played uh, um, accordion like you never heard. It sounded like a, a brass section when he played the accordion. It was just great. He was a marvelous arranger. And uh, my mother had a Hammond organ. My mother was a fine pianist. She had a Hammond organ when they first came out. And uh, they asked her if it would be all right if they used her organ in our house for demonstrations, for oh. appointments. And uh, I don't know what kind of uh, 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 if she got paid for that or anything like that, or they gave her the Maybe organ, the, uh -huh. probably something like that. Anyway, Joe Mooney heard about it and came up, and he played the organ. You couldn't get my mother away from him, <laughs> but he played the organ. He was unbelievable. So he brought some guys up, and they let me jam with them. Mm -hmm. And that's they really taught me how to play on those jam sessions. It was great. I was playing with Bobby Dominic, Bucky Pizzarelli's older uncle. Oh my. Well, that's where, that's the U.S. Next time you see Bucky, ask him about Bobby Dominic. And he was the guy, he sat right next to me. And I listened to him, jing, 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 jing. I was like, ah, boy, right. And I played with those guys, and it was marvelous. And they taught me how to keep time. They really were great with me. They were so tolerant. I know, that, you know, I say I th thought everybody loved me, but I don't, I don't know what I was, I don't know how I sounded, really. Mm -hmm. But they were tolerant, and they asked me to play all the time. So then we go to this contest. Mm -hmm. So Gene finally decides, I asked him to sign my snare drum for luck, you know, yeah. he autographed it, yeah. you know. It was, and I had that head for years. I don't know what happened to it, but I had it for years. Anyway, he was so gracious. And uh, I was number three. And uh, so they finally decided, here's the way we'll do this. We'll get a small group from the band, like four or five guys, and play two choruses of a tune with each drummer and let him, let him, the first chorus would be together, and then the second chorus would be the drum solo, and then the last eight bars out, okay? Well, I knew what he was talking about because I'd been playing with these guys. Ah, and Because uh, sure. they say, Sonny, you play the bridge, or you play the last eight, or something like that. I knew where it was because I could hear it. So anyway, Gene gets, it comes to be my turn. I was number three. He says, okay, now, Sonny, what would you like to play? <laughs> I was struck dumb, absolutely dumb. And uh, I, he said, uh, I said, gee, I, I don't know. He said, how about China Boy? Well, I 
So I said, fine, because I've been playing China Boy for years with his record <laughs> when he was with <laughs> Benny Goodman. You uh -huh. know? So I knew the tune backwards and forwards. So he says, you play four bars and they'll come in. I said, okay. So I repeated, whatever I did. Yeah. And they came in and I played through and then I played the solo and then the last eight bars out. And I was one of the only ones who knew what to do. The rest of the kids just played solos all the time. Mm -hmm. They didn't know how to play in a band. You they had the drums. You could but play I was some keeping time. time yeah. And I knew when the song was time for me to play, and when the last eight bars came, they'd go back, they would all come in again, and they all did. And Gene said, boy, they don't fool around with it up in Ridgewood. You know, so anyway, I figured that by the time they decided who was going to win, they'd forgotten about me. I was number three. And three out of 40. Out uh, of 40, about 40. <laughs> so anyway, uh, they brought, uh, uh, Gene brought about, six or eight of us up on the stage, and I was thrilled to standing at the stage on, on sta the bandstand at the Meadowbrook. They had, I had worked there many times after that, but uh, I was like, you know, this is big time stuff. <laughs> so anyway, uh, uh, Gene goes down the line, you know, like they used to do, but put his hands over this guy and over this guy and over this guy, and I was the last one he came to, and I got the biggest hand. Uh, I don't see how anybody remembered me. And some guys had their own cheering sections there, uh -huh. but still and all, my mother said she didn't. Th she said I didn't think you were going to beat that kid that has all his friends. <laughs> and so anyway, uh, sure enough, uh, I, I won the contest, and uh, a lot of people heard about it mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. And uh, you know, I, I was a lucky kid. I was lucky I met those guys right. and had that opportunity to play with them at an early age. And uh, I was a heavy listener and a, a heavy practicer. And uh, I had some luck. Yeah. And it was a lucky day for me because I, uh, I, I was a little on the sick side. I had a sore throat and a, a, a little temperature. But I said, uh, they said, maybe you better stay home. I said, no, I'm not going to stay home. Take me down there because I couldn't drive. So that was it. And, uh, and Gene kind of adopted me as his protege. He would, inter uh, you know, I'd go see him play at different places and he'd, he'd come on up here. And, oh, uh, and they'd uh, be signing autographs, and uh, they said, and people were like, who's that kid? Who's that kid? And said, this is my, this is my protege, it's in Sunny Igo, and he's a protege of mine. Because uh -huh. he sent me to a teacher in New York after I won the contest. My mother uh, said to him, uh, do you think he can do anything with the drums? He said, are you kidding? He can't miss. Uh -huh. So he said, I'm gonna, I, I have a teacher for you to go to in New York. She said, New York? So she took me to the first lesson, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then I went by myself. At that time, from Ridgewood to New York, the bus fare was 35 cents. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So I used to go for my lessons in New York and come home, you know, mm -hmm. on my own. Uh, uh, I was 16, and uh, it, it was a marvelous time for me. It was marvelous, because then I was in the mix in New York already. But the yeah. competition with other students who were coming into this mm -hmm. guy and they were hanging around and talking and this, that, and the other thing. Making the connections. Very, very f famous drummer. Uh, he and I became very good friends over the years with Ed Shaughnessy. And um, he took lessons with the same guy. And we were like, sort of like, as we got older, friendly rivals. And, you know, I went to service and uh, Ed was too young. And then when I came out, he was still there. And mm -hmm. so we, you know, we, we, we took up our friendship again and uh, we were helpful to each other in our careers. And I, I recommended, recommended him for jobs and he recommended me. Because you can't do anything alone in this business. Mm. You gotta have help. But I had a lot of help when I was a kid. You know, people had, uh, you know, telling me things, giving me advice. And uh, you can't do anything without people recommending you. Your reputation precedes you and People, uh, when you've done a certain amount of things or with a certain amount of people, then you don't audition anymore. I see. You know, the thing with me was when I uh, got the gig with Benny Goodman and played with him for a year. After that, I, I didn't have to audition for anybody. That they just call and say, "Are you available?" Uh -huh. You know, because they right. figure, well, you played with Benny. You know, you know yeah. that's a good test. That's great. So, uh, that was uh, that was after the war, though. What did the other things were pre-war. What did your parents uh, do for a living? Your father. My father uh, was in a business he hated. He was uh, the manager of a finance company in, in uh, uh, Jersey City. It was a, it was a family business. Mm -hmm. uh, his, his father and uh, 
I think his mother too, I don't, well my grandmother, I don't know if she was born in Jersey City, but he came over from Ireland as a young man, his father, my grandfather, okay. came over from Ireland. And he started this business, he was a smart guy I guess, he started this business, he had the license number three in New Jersey for all the finance companies in, in New Jersey, he had number three. And uh, uh, so uh, my father, when he died, my father had to run the business and he hated that. He, he didn't like it, yeah. and uh, uh, so anyway, uh, uh, that's where that's what he did. My mother was like all mothers back then; she was home all the time, mm -hmm. you know. But she was a very fine classical pianist. We had a we had a full size concert grand in our living room, mm -hmm. and boy, she used to have concerts there, and they'd bring people out from New York who were supposed to be good and all that kind of stuff. They had a, like a, cl a music club, and they'd bring people out from New York, and I would be up above the piano in my bedroom and I could hear some of these people and I'd say, boy, it sounds like he's clubbing it. You know, he's then my mother would play and her touch was so much better than a lot of them. Here she's a housewife, but she was a practicing fool. Now I tell people this story because talk about practice. She had small hands, she couldn't reach that far, you know. Yeah. So she was constantly doing these kind of exercises to, to get loose. And um, she had this uh, system. She put a hundred matches here, okay, yeah. uh, on this side of the piano, and she's trying a certain thing from a certain concerto, down and up, or and then okay, put one match over there. Another match over there. A hundred from this side, then a hundred from that side up on another portion. That she, the way she, I, may, that might be where I got my pra practice ethic because in the high school I used to practice four to six hours a day myself all the time. I wasn't, I wasn't uh, scholastically great, uh -huh. <laughs> but I had blinders on. Everything was drums and everybody knew it was going to be drums, you know. So there was wasn't it. much doubt what you were going to oh, be absolutely. doing for a living. Absolutely. My father, as long as Gene Krupa was in charge, so to speak, sending me to a teacher and saying that he thought I had the stuff that I could make a, a go of it, you know. And did your parents like uh, the swing music oh, of the day too? Oh, absolutely. Okay. And my mother was nuts about it. And she would, she would say, see the way he's playing? He said, he's so smooth and he smiles, but he's got another thing, like that, that mm. she'd call it, mm. he's got a lot of, mm. you know. <laughs> That's neat. <laughs> That's a, it's funny. Um, Nowadays, and I think for a while, there's been a separation between children and adults as far as their musical tastes. Well, probably uh, there was certainly a big uh, disparaging thing in this house. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I had a magnificent, uh, uh, treated myself, and I finally started making a little decent money. I treated myself to a marvelous uh, stereo system for the upstairs, all Macintosh and big JBL uh, mm -hmm. sp studio monitor speakers and oh what a system it's still up there it's never been played above four it's <laughs> yeah. so powerful uh -huh. so anyway uh, my kids uh, started the the girls well my girls uh, they're uh, about six years apart but it was the Beatles you know when the Beatles started and I, I would say how can you listen to that I said those I said, that's terrible it's like nursery rhymes set the music you can sing little three blind mice like that. It's terrible really? music. Yeah. Well, so naturally, the Beatles were the Beatles, and that's all the kids are walking up and down the street singing the Beatles songs. You know, nobody's singing Bennett Goodman licks or anymore <laughs> <laughs> like that. But anyway, uh, I should have realized that the hand wiring was on a wall back then. Uh -huh. But I was stubborn. Yeah. <laughs> so, and I said, you can't play that stuff on my machine. Play it up in the bedroom and your, on your stuff. You can't do it on my stuff. So they had to play theirs upstairs. Did they have any sense that you used to be in the middle of what was swinging pop, popular music? Did, did oh, they I realize think so. that? Oh, I think so, that uh, especially in the days when it, uh, I got to stay home. See, I spent an awful lot of time on the road. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I started to stay home. I had a, a good Dixieland career down in... Uh, Nix in Greenwich Village when that was the place for Dixieland. Then I, actually that was the best steady jazz job in New York at the time. Hmm. And so I played there for three or four years. And um, uh, that was after I had finished with the Charlie Ventura's group. And uh, I um, 
played there for about three or four years. So I was, uh, finally, uh, it's not like, okay, you have a, a, a job for six months and then oh, oh, you're off for three or something like that. This was like a year-round thing, mm -hmm. seven, uh, six nights a week and a Sunday afternoon. Wow. So you were, we, Every we, we, single day. Oh, yeah. We worked from, uh, the hours were uh, 9.30 to 4 on weeknights, 9 to 3 on Saturday night, and Sunday afternoon from 5 to 9 and then uh, 10 to 3. That was the week. And it was marvelous. We played uh, these all great musicians and uh, really was a, 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 a fun job. Can I ask how much you were making for that? Yes, was kind we of were making, uh, I started at um, a hundred dollars, uh, pardon me, a hundred and fifty dollars a week. And three days later, I got a. Uh, um, uh, after I three days after I had started, I got a telegram from the leader, saying, "I'm giving you a thirty dollar raise." <laughs> so I went up to a hundred and eighty, but that was unheard of in a jazz club in New York. The guys up the street, uh, I, I I won't mention names, uh, but mm -hmm. guys up the street uh, at the Village Vanguard. Uh, Putting in, they didn't have a Sunday afternoon matinee, but they had six nights like we did, the same hours till four in the morning. That's New York was going till four in the morning in those days, because mm -hmm. you could walk the streets. There was no problems, and uh, uh, I would meet some of these guys. That th there was a diner midway between us, so we go have a cup of coffee and meet some of these guys and the guys you knew. And I'd be, hey, what are you doing? Oh, I'm up at the Vanguard. Uh, what are you doing? Oh, I'm playing at Nick's. Oh, hey, what are you making down there? <laughs> I said, uh, I'm making 180. He said, what? Yeah, 180. I said, well, what are you guys making up there? He says, 80. 80 bucks a week. This is mid-50s, right? This is uh, going to the end of, yes, it was from 54 on. 54 on. Mm. Mm -hmm. There's no scale for those kind of clubs. No, the union wasn't in any of those things. And... Um, so uh, the Knicks always had a reputation for paying their guys well, but they worked. But you worked hard, and it was a it was a very pleasant atmosphere, no problems. And uh, uh, you know, I can remember when I started when I started with Benny Goodman's band. Now that now we're talking nineteen. Uh, what would that be? Nineteen forty-eight. Forty. Uh, forty-eight and forty-nine. That's right. I was going to say forty-seven. No, forty-eight, and. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a long story con con uh, current concern with this, and it's the thing I told you before, you, you can't do anything alone. Mm -hmm. Somebody's got to help you. So I had come off the uh, road playing with two, uh, uh, three, what we would call back, back in those days, B bands. They weren't the, like Benny Goodman or that sort of thing. They were like a guy named Tommy Reed who, was, who had a band that was made up of all ex-servicemen. I went out to uh, San Francisco to play with him. And then I was with uh, Les Elgarth's band down at the Meadowbrook. And then I was with a, a lady band leader named Ina Ray Hutton. I don't know if you ever heard of mm -hmm. her. She used to have a girl band, but now she had a guy band. And uh, uh, then all those jobs fizzled out. And then from one to another, you get a call from, a, would you like to audition for Ina Ray Hutton? Sure, because I don't have a gig, you know, so I did. And uh, uh, I wasn't married yet or anything like that. So I was, uh, those two, those bands, uh, Tommy Reed, Ina Ray Hutton, and Les Algart were $90 bands. Well, that's a week on the road with hotels and meals. You had to pay your own. You had own. to pay your own. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you wonder, the fact, geez, 90 bucks, how did I ever do that? You know? So, okay, now I'm with Benny. Now, now a, a long thing goes on, and I know that Benny Goodman's rehearsing a new band. And, and, and I also heard that he was getting a drummer every day didn't like anybody or blah, 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 whatever it was. So uh, guys are telling me, there used to be a hangout in New York called Charlie's Tavern, where everybody used to go because beers were a nickel, and we could <laughs> hang around there, drink beer, and lie, you know, tell a lot of <laughs> lies. So anyway, those guys were always, hey, Sonny, you know, you want to go up to uh, Benny's rehearsal. He said, he's, he's having trouble finding somebody he likes. And I said, oh, he'll probably hire Shelly Man or somebody like that, you know. And uh, But I thought about it and thought about it, and it came to me that I had the acquaintance of a man uh, who was an insurance executive who was a friend of Benny Goodman. And he used to hang around Charlie's Tavern. He loved musicians. He loved to talk to us and all that kind of stuff. So I asked him, his name was Eddie First. And I said, Ed, uh, do you think you could 
introduced me to Benny Goodman so I could audition. He said, sure, Sonny, I can fix that. I mean, he said, I don't know why I didn't think of that. He said, good, I'll call him. So he called me the next day and said, we're going up uh, Thursday at, at uh, 11 o'clock or whatever the heck it was, right? So he takes me, we go up there, and uh, he's rehearsing at MCA in New York, uh, uh, wherever their offices were, they had an auditorium. And uh, they're rehearsing in there, and I had a very good ear. I could mem I memorize very quickly, and luckily, mm -hmm. it's another lucky thing, you can't teach it. So anyway, uh, uh, we go up there, and the band is playing, and they're rehearsing this one tune three or four times through, five or six times through, whatever. And I'm listening to it, and, you know, I'm getting that down pretty good already, and I'll see if I, if I could play that tune. But you, you never know, you know, yeah. right? You have to go up and sight read. So anyway, but I could, I, I could read passively. I wasn't, I, not to what I developed into. But any, anyway, we, uh, he, uh, they take a break. And so uh, Benny says, Eddie, how are you? He comes over and shakes his hand. He says, this is the young man I was telling you about, Benny. He says, oh, he says, nice to meet you, son. He says, why don't you play the next set? He said, well, we will take a 10 minute break or something like that. So you play the next set. So the drummer had, the drummer was from Philadelphia and he was very inexperienced. It was really nice, get scared to death. You know, not that I wasn't nervous, but Benny Goodman, my God, I never played, the, this is a whole new strata for me. Mm -hmm. And this kid, had, I don't think he played with anybody. Somebody, I don't even, <laughs> no, I don't even no, know how we got there. <laughs> but anyway, uh, he was so accommodating. He said, oh yeah, he, I said, do you mind if I use your drums uh, to play the next set or something? He said, oh, please. He said, he said please, you know, and he, so we, we introduce ourselves yeah. and all that kind of stuff. He's a very nice guy. Uh, but w wasn't ready for that. Uh, I wasn't sure I was, mm -hmm. you know, because my heart was going like this, you know. I, but I knew several guys in the band from Charlie's Tavern and around town. I hadn't worked with any any of the guys yet. Anyway. So anyway, okay, I sit in and they play that tune that I had sat through five or six times and I had the part up, you know, like I yeah. pretend I'm reading it. <laughs> and so anyway, I didn't have to really read much of it. it. It wasn't that complex, but there was a couple of starts and stops and a few things in it. And uh, I went through it like, it was just like mm -hmm. that. So Benny looked up, he says, like this. And then he says, stay up there, Pops, you know. Pops, so we he called uh, Pops everybody. already. Yeah, yeah, he called yeah. everybody Pops. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, he says, stay up there, Pops. So <laughs> anyway, I stayed up there and we played a few more tunes. I got lucky enough to get through. And then he said, okay, everybody's through. We'll play with the, we'll play with the quartet. So he says, stay up there, Pops. So Buddy Greco was the piano player, and uh, Benny, and the bass player was a fellow named Clyde Lombardi. Uh, and uh, so we played with just a small group for about an hour. And uh, so then he packs up and walks out. Didn't say a word to me, that was it. So uh, I'm, I'm uh, he's, he just, oh, he did say, come back tomorrow. Bring your own drums or something like that. You know, so yeah, so I go back tomorrow. And then I played the whole rehearsal. And then again at the end he goes to the small band, you know, because he loved playing with the smaller group too. And we played that. And uh, so it's going on, it's going on three weeks now. We're rehearsing for three weeks. And I get a call from another clarinet player, a guy named Jerry Wald. Mm -hmm. You ever hear that name? Mm -hmm. Anyway, he was going into the Paramount Theater. And uh, he asked me if I'd be interested in doing the Paramount with him. I said, yeah, well, I'm rehearsing with Benny. He said, well, did he hire you yet? I said, I've been doing it for three weeks. He hasn't said a word. He said, well, listen, I can give you another couple of days, then I'll have to get somebody else. He said, but the job is yours if you want it. And I said, okay, thank you. Very, very nice of you, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, the next day I'm at rehearsal with Benny, right? Now, Benny used to walk around, as I call, tootling all the time. He goes, and he comes up to me and gives me a nudge. And he's tootling. He goes like this. He says, get your suit yet, Pops? And I said, what do you mean, get my suit yet? He says, you know, your uniform. Because the band was going to Saks Fifth Avenue for tuxedo coats, you know. So uh, I said, no. He said, why, why, why didn't you get your uniform? I said, nobody told me I was hired. He said, nobody told you you were, hi you were hired the first day. He said, nobody said anything? I said, no, you never said anything. He said, he's supposed to... Where's, where's, what's his name? So the nap man, he, 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 come up here, talk to him. So, okay, <laughs> now the big decision of my life comes up, right? So the guy says, 
Oh, Sonny was my fault. He said, I apologize. He said, you, Benny loves the way, blah, 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 blah. So he says, you got the job. And he says, you got to get it, got to get your uniform. And I, I said, uh, he said, now, how much money do you want? Mm. Nobody ever asked me that before, right? Mm -hmm. I can remember Gene Krupa saying, that if you ever play with Benny Goodman, he respects you if you ask for a lot of money. <laughs> but I didn't feel as though I was that secure. Uh -huh. you know? yeah. But that ran through my mind. So I, I had come from these, like I said, I came from these $90 bands. Mm -hmm. Never made more than 90 bucks a week. So uh, I kind of haltingly says, how about 125? He says, well, I think we can make that. And I could almost hear him going chuckle, 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 you know, but. <laughs> You're going, <laughs> so, ah. Yeah, but, so anyway, that's the way that, that went. I went to, I was the lowest paid guy in the band. Mm -hmm. I would have swept out the bus, I don't care. <laughs> but uh, I spent a year with Benny uh, until he when he broke up the band. We went to the Philippines for a month with a quartet. Uh, but I spent a year with him. And I really uh, felt as though I, I learned a lot. Mm -hmm. I came a long way experience-wise and how to play and really play in a band and to you know, have somebody as, as good as him. Uh, he never once, he used to be, uh, from, a, from a lot of guys, I say, but he used to be very bad on a lot of people, but he never once said anything to me about my playing. He never said, you're playing too loud, you're rushing, you're dragging, you're doing mm -hmm. this, you're doing that. Never said anything. Always looked just fine. Not that we were buddy buddy, but he never said anything about my playing. So I figured I was all right. Wow. And uh, uh, so that put me off the, over the top from a standpoint of uh, having to audition with other bands. If I right. went with so far, I went from Benny Goodman to Woody Herman. Uh, you know when. Uh, that was my next step. Right. But uh, uh, it was a, it was um, it was funny in those days. The way uh, everybody is, uh, boy, you got to watch. Are you working for Benny? Oh, oh, oh. Did you get the Ray yet? You know, yeah. they, they talk about the Ray. I have a story about the Ray. If you're interested, have you heard have, about that? I've heard about it, but please well, but go the, ahead. The, the thing is that he would. Uh, he even said to us one night at the Palladium in uh, Hollywood. Uh, he says, the, you've heard a lot about the Ray. He says, I'm not really mad at anybody. He says, sometimes I daydream and my mind wanders and I just happen to be looking somebody's direction. I'm not trying to stare them down or anything like that, you know, blah, blah, blah. So, okay. So now uh, uh, we're in Canada doing a whole string of one-nighters in the hockey rinks. <laughs> they used to put uh, the boards down on the ice, you know, so people could dance. And then they, they would build this tremendous movie set for the band. <laughs> like they'd have the saxes down here and then, then each uh -huh. section up. The drums were like up there, <laughs> way up at the top. Unbelievable. You couldn't hear anything. You couldn't hear, you couldn't hear the band. You uh -huh. were so far away. And so and Benny's down there. We played the first set. And Benny's down there. He's, he's looking around, puzzled. And, and he looks up at me. And I had a, another small set down in front for this a small group. Right. You know? So he looks up to me and he goes, uh, that's supposed to, you know what that means. He goes, come on down here and play down here. Okay, so if, not a word was said. So I pick up my sticks, brushes, go downstairs to, to the other set and uh, play the set down there. And I'm in seventh heaven because the whole band is right here in my ear. Mm -hmm. Oh, what a feeling that is. You hear the, it's, that's why when people play music today, all they do is turn up the bass. They go, blug, blug, blug. <laughs> it doesn't sound like music. But <laughs> when you have the, the brilliance of uh -huh. the brass and the saxophones right in, oh man, it's hi-fi, the original yeah. hi-fi. So anyway, okay, we take a break. Now we're coming back up. I'm down front now. And I, I, got a little closer and got myself comfortable. And I have my music stand here in case I need some charts. And Benny's right over my music stand like this eye level. I'm kind of kitty corner to him like that. Mm -hmm. I look here, there he is. Now he had the habit of having his clarinet under his arm like this, you know, holding it this way. So he was in that pose looking right at me. And uh, I could hear some murmurs in the background. Guys in the sax section are saying, uh oh, it looks like it's Sunday's turn in a barrel tonight or something like that. <laughs> all right, all these kind of things. So he's, he's just looking at me over the top of the stand, over the top of my stand, you know, mm -hmm. just staring at me. And I just, I had enough. So I stood up. Now, this is true. I stood up 
and I went like this in front of his eyes. <laughs> he never budged. The band fell. Everybody's yeah. having hysterics <laughs> in the background. They, they probably figured I'd get canned right then. You know, what? It's like, sit, sit down, kid, what are you doing? You yeah. know? He never knew I did it. See, he just said, okay, let's go. We're going to the next number. <laughs> Lord. He never, I knew that story got around town even in New York. Jeez, I heard what you did to Benny. <laughs> it was funny. Never, uh, uh, he never even acknowledged it, you know. And, uh, but I did see him ride some guys sometimes that mm -hmm. uh, I felt sorry for him, you know. Yeah. Uh, I think it was one of those things that every once in a while, if he got in that mood, if he knew he could ride you, he'd ride you. There are people like that, you know, that if they knew they can take advantage of you, they'll do it or, uh -huh. or try. Well, Ed Shaughnessy thing. told us about just, you know, he got in his case once and he just went real weird on him and kind of one-upped him and shipped him and oh, yeah? left him alone after that. Oh, yeah, sure, yeah. sure. Well, that must have been after, after my after, episode yeah, after. because uh, uh, Ed and I didn't see each other for a long time. Yeah. And, uh, but that was, uh, I, know, I knew that he had played with Benny, so yeah. that, but I didn't know that he had a, an episode, so to speak. Yeah. yeah. Was uh, the, um, when you were touring with, with Benny, um, or later Woody Herman, were you playing for like integrated audiences? Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. But the problem was that when you got down south, they couldn't uh, mingle. You know, they'd have a, uh, the, the, uh, of course, then we were, everybody was colored, you know. They, the, the, the term. They, the, yeah, the yeah. term was colored. So the, the, the colors would be in the balcony. You know, they could listen, but they couldn't come down and dance. I don't know if they danced in the hallways or anything like that, because we can see. But they were, they were definitely seg segregated. And uh, we didn't have any black guys in the band when, uh, with Benny in, in, in the year I was with, excuse me, I was on a tour with Stan Kenton in 1954 uh, uh, when I was with Charlie Ventura. And we had, I was, there was two buses, there were so many people on this tour, it was a, it was a great, he called it the Festival of Modern American Jazz. And it was Stan Kenton's band and uh, Shirley Rogers and Shelley Mann. Our Tatum Trio, <laughs> oh, the, the June Christie, uh, uh, Lenny, uh, uh, oh, I can't think of his name. Anyway, Niehaus? Not, uh, no, not the not oh. Niehaus was in the band. Oh, uh, uh, but uh, anyway, a whole bunch of people, and uh, uh, it was a th almost a three-hour show, and Charlie Ventura's group with Marianne McCall singing, and uh, so uh, we played down south. You know, we, we, we went on a 68-night tour with no breaks, oh. no nights off, and two buses. And I was in the bus with Art Tatum and his trio guys and uh, a couple other fellows, the band boy and a couple other guys. There, were, there weren't as many people in our bus. Most of the band was in the other bus. And I, I, my, my window mate was Jimmy, uh, my bus mate was Jimmy Jufri. The guy who wrote Four Brothers, mm -hmm. Woody. <laughs> he and I were yakking all the time. He's a marvelous guy, terrific guy. He is, he, you look at, at Jimmy and you think he doesn't have a personality because he's so quiet and his demeanor is so professorial, as we would say. Oh. And, uh, but he's got a, a wacky sense of humor and it, it was a pleasure to talk with him all this time. So we would get down south with this, but the guys couldn't get up. Art and his guys couldn't, we stopped for a rest stop. They couldn't get off the bus. We'd stop for eat. They couldn't get off the bus. I used to bring coffee, sodas, and stuff. We all did, you know. Mm -hmm. Everybody catered to those guys, you know, because they couldn't get. They were. They didn't want to get involved in anything because it was still like that down mm -hmm. there. Then, because when I was, I remember when I was in the Marines, it was terrible during the war in, in the southern city, southern, southern cities. It was terrible. And Even. They didn't even respect it. They were servicemen. No, 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 terrible. As a matter of fact, we used to we used to get in, sometimes in trouble. There would there would be two drinking fountains, whites only, colored only. We'd always drink out of the colored, and, and, and people would go, get out of there, you white, you know, white trash, and that kind of stuff. You know. Is that right? Oh, that's well, that's in the forties. Yeah. Uh huh. But the, the, you don't, you know, you can't imagine that today. Actually, terrible. But uh, uh, they didn't have that kind of, you know, with uh, 
they couldn't stay in the same hotels. They had to have their the in the section of town where they could stay, and yeah. some of them stay in the, like uh, boarding houses. So, but there were, we we there was no extended stays on that tour. So uh, you know, once in a while we'd stay over because the next jump wasn't that far, you know. But um, that's the way it was mm. back then. And then that even though the, you know we could like. Gene had Roy Eldridge in his band for years uh, before that time, uh, in the late 30s and all that kind of stuff. It must have been terrible I for, guess. for those guys back then. Yeah. Next. Well. Where are we? We're uh, Who did we just <laughs> finish with? <laughs> I know. You eventually got, um, <coughs> did you get tired of the road? Oh, I got tired of the road, yeah. that's. Um, I was with Ina Ray Hutton's band in, uh, uh, we had played a big uh, nightclub in New York called the Latin Quarter. When there was a Latin Quarter, it was a very, it was like the Copacabana, with showgirls and all this kind of stuff. And um, then we, uh, with Ina Ray Hutton's band, then we went out to uh, Covington, Kentucky. Now Covington, Kentucky is just across the river from Cincinnati. And they had a, a miniature Las Vegas there, three casinos, I think. Not, <laughs> not like a casino today, but uh, you could gamble, you know. La roulette wheel and blackjack and all that stuff. So uh, we were at a place called the uh, Lookout House with Ina Ray Hutton's band. And they had a big show built around Ina Ray Hutton that they had uh, made from the, uh, modeled on the Latin Quarter thing, like, like a package. And they had uh, eight dancing girls. I had to go to Covington, Kentucky to meet a girl from Brooklyn. <laughs> That's how my wife and I met. Is that right? Yeah. She was in the chorus line. No kidding. Yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. And uh, she said, you used to try to louse us up every night with that two-bar solo you played. <laughs> <laughs> so we all get out of step. <laughs> <laughs> but that's when, so, and, and you mentioned being on the road. So uh, 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 I got married, uh, the, I guess, uh, must have been a year or two after that. Um, we got married. And I was with Woody's band. And... Um, he gave me two weeks off to get married. So uh, we came home and we got uh, nothing special, you know, no big wedding or anything like you that. You weren't throwing but sandwiches. My grandmother you was weren't very throwing sick. sandwiches, were you? No, so, no, no, <laughs> nothing like that. Uh, I think we went to the local tavern. <laughs> so anyway, uh, uh, oh, I remember our wedding night. My wife and I saw two Charles Dickens movies. Really? Yeah. Because <laughs> the next day we were getting in the car and driving out to Nebraska. Oh. On the way to to meet the band in the Fall City, Nebraska, I think it was. So anyway, um, to make a long story short, my wife got pregnant early mm -hmm. and uh, had to leave me on the road. You know, she had to go home. So my father and mother found a place in North Bergen that building new apartments in those days, and so we got an apartment over there. And um, uh, uh, she had the baby. Uh, uh, I came, uh, I wanted to get time off because of the baby, and Woody wouldn't give it to me. And uh, so I said, well, I'm going to have to leave the band. He said, well, we said, leave the band, okay. Mm -hmm. So I left the band. And the last night I had with the band, I was, um, we were playing at Buckeye Lake, Ohio. It's a big place where bands play. And across the lake was Tommy Dorsey's band, playing the same night. Now they got, they got through an hour before we did. So they came around to us on their in their bus to hear our band. So we're we're uh, we're playing our last couple of sets, and the, those guys. And I knew Louis Belson. He was with the, he was mm -hmm. with the band, and and Louis came in and all. The, and uh, so anyway, uh, uh, we're playing our last couple of sets, and uh, uh, Tommy's talking to Woody. Woody told him that I was leaving. He says he's leaving the band, and he says, "How come?" He says, "Well, his wife's going to have a baby." Oh, where does he live? New Jersey. He says, well, we're going to be playing in New Jersey for a month. So he, uh, uh, Louis Belson was leaving. He didn't have anybody <laughs> set. So he, he, he had his manager come up and talk to me about joining the band. So I left Woody one day and, and joined uh, Tommy Dorsey two days later <laughs> at the Syracuse Hotel up, uh, up in Syracuse. And so I was supposed to play uh, at the, a place called the Rustic Cabin for a month with the band. Because we lived just a few miles down the, uh, the pike, so to speak, mm -hmm. on the Palisades. So anyway, uh, he's, he um, uh, gets on the bandstand and says, oh, geez, it's great to have a drum, blah, 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 blah. So anyway, uh, the last night 
we had a jam session, you know, that was very good. It was a lot of fun and all that kind of stuff uh, in the hotel, uh, you know, on the stand in the hotel. And um, so we pack up and all this stuff, and the whole stuff is going on a truck or a bus or whatever. They got it around in those days, I forgot. So uh, anyway, I'm in bed about four, and I get a, the phone rings. And I pick up the phone, and uh, uh, he said, Sonny, I said, yes. He said, this is so-and-so. I forget the guy's name, the manager of the band. He said, Tommy just told me to fire you. And uh, I said, what? I said, I thought he said he liked the way I play. He says, I don't know. He said, get rid of that guy. So I said, okay. So I said, but I wanted the money for the rough the cabin or I'm going to take it to the union. So he said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you, uh, I was going, I forget what I was going to get for the, for the, it was, it was pretty good money uh, for me at that time. I think it was about 300 bucks a week. But, uh, he said, um, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you, it's four weeks. I'll give you $400 cash tomorrow and we'll forget about it. Because then he was going to put the rest in his pocket. He was going to tell Tommy he had to pay me and he would put the rest of that money in uh -huh. his pocket. Because he was famous for that. So and that's why some of those band leaders died broke, you know. Mm. Their managers were doing that to him. So anyway, uh, uh, as it happened, uh, I went to the union and said, this is what they said, and this is what has happened. And I said, okay. They said, oh, okay, we'll back you. And I said, but they want me to come there every night, you know, and just hang around for a while. He said, well, how far is it from your home? I said, it's six or eight miles. He said, well, why don't you keep it quiet? Just go up there, hang around for an hour and leave. And he said, we'll back you up, and we'll get your money. And so they did. They got the money. They got the full, uh, the full 1,200 bucks. You know, it was 1,200 bucks. It was 1,200 bucks. Yeah. And... Uh, <laughs> Uh, so they got the money for me, and so when Tom, the, uh, the first night I went up there, Tommy was busy uh, resetting the band. He didn't like the way they had set it up, so I went. went and my drums were on the corner. And they unloaded them, so I uh, went over to get the drums, and I said, "Hey, Tommy, I thought you said you liked the way I played," and he he had a very raspy kind of voice. He said, "Listen to me, kid. I don't want anybody in my band who I think is putting me on." He said, all you young guys think you play different from somebody else. I said, That's, I said, I, I said well, I'm not, uh, I don't think I'm any different, but I thought you said you liked it. He's, nah, I don't want anybody in my band who I think is putting me on. So then he says, did you ever hear of, of Ray Wetzel? I said, sure, a great trumpet player. He said, he was on this band four times before I let him stay. I said, do me a favor, don't call me four times. So anyway, but he called me twice. Is that, <laughs> that right? I instantly called me twice. After that incident, so anyway, I never worked with him again, you know. But that was uh, that was it. I took my drums and went home. <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> but that's a you know just another uh, a little story over a couple of beers. You ready for another story? Yeah. We're on a one nighter one nighters <laughs> with Woody Herman's band, and when I joined Woody Herman's band in 1950, he was fighting big debts. You know, IRS and uh, GMAC, his booking agency, that I think they were into him. He was into them for about 90000 or something like that. And he owed over 100000 to the IRS. That's from the manager who screwed him up. And he had this guy, Abe Turchin, his manager, who got him out of debt. And then he screwed him up. Oh. Uh, he died broke because of him. Yeah. But anyway, uh, uh, we're on the bus and this... Dear friend of mine, marvelous trumpet player, I won't mention his name, he can play anything on the trumpet, play high screeching, beautiful soft ballads, fast bebop, any style, Dixieland, swing, bebop, anything. On the, it's just marvelous, world class, and he was a junkie. And when they would run out of junk, they'd drink whiskey like uh, it was coming out of a water faucet, you know to try to help get over it. Well, finally, we were, we were on the, in an unair conditioned bus. We were down Kentucky or South Carolina, someplace, I don't know, out in the Georgia, I don't know, in that kind of country. We're all rural, all hot, and we, had, we each had a, a double seat because there's a lot of seats on the bus and there were only 15 guys or whatever. Yeah. So right across from me is this guy who's a dear friend of mine. And I'm fa finally falling asleep, and I said, oh, go to sleep, go to sleep. I almost said his name. I don't want to say his name. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I'm falling asleep. I'm so, uh, I go, I smell burning flesh 
okay, and I look over, and here's this guy, he had a cigarette with his hand, oh, he's unconscious practically, has a cigarette like here, and it had burned down between his two fingers, and was burning his flesh, and smoking, it was actually smoking. So I go like this across the aisle, knock it off, naturally wake him up, and he started in on me like, uh, uh, you know, I can't, uh, can't mention the words he used and how dumb I was and what's the idea and blah, blah, blah. And I tried to explain to him. The next day he saw it. Didn't bother him at all. Played like it never happened. Played like it never happened. Mm. But that's how, unfortunately, some of those guys ruined their lives with that stuff. Mm. And it's, it's no... Uh, I, was, I was glad I was... Uh, a square. A, 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 it's a lot. <laughs> a couple a of lot, beers is good enough for me. <laughs> yeah, stick with being a Boy Scout. Jeez. Well, tell me a little bit about the <coughs> making living in the studio scene in, in New York. Did well. Did that was one of the happiest times of my yeah. life because I was always, always home and saw my children, uh -huh. and uh, saw my children grow up, and because uh, I missed so much of my first daughter when we were when I was with Woody. He, he gave me time to go home with the, for the baby, and, and uh, I had to quit, you know, to get the time. And so he had another two or three drummers uh, during that. I was off for 10 weeks, out of the band for 10 weeks. And um, so uh, um, our baby was now uh, close to 10 weeks old, okay? And um, uh, I get a call. I thought that... Oh, I already played with Woody Herman. I already played with Benny Goodman successfully. I should be able to make it in the New York recording s scene now. You know, I just hang mm -hmm. around and meet guys and get work. Failure. Complete really? failure. Didn't, I worked one job in 10 weeks. Paid $12. And on that job, we had two bands. It was at a, a, a jazz club in New York called The Downbeat. And it was on 54th Street, just off 8th Avenue. And the first band was Charlie Parker, Max Roach, um, um, uh, uh, the bass player was uh, Mingus, Charlie Mingus, and uh, I forget who the piano player was. And we had two trombone players, um, uh, Kay Winding and Bill Harris from uh, uh, my Woody Herman days, mm -hmm. and a rhythm section, myself and uh, 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 Percy Heath was a bass player, and I forget who the piano player was in it. Uh, anyway, uh, we played, uh, this is my first job in 10 weeks. We played alternating sets from 9 to 4 in the morning. I guess we each played 3 or 4, I forget which. But anyway, we all made the same. Charlie Parker, everybody, 12 bucks. We all made 12 bucks. That was it. That was the only job I had. So I get a call from Woody's manager and said, hey, Sonny, uh, Woody's not that happy with anybody since you left. He said, uh, would you consider coming back with the band? And I said, sure. I said, uh, can I get a little more money? He says, yeah, I think so. He says, how much, how much more? So now I was making 125, right? So I said, well, how about 150 clear? Like you pay my taxes. He says, yeah, we'll do that. But he didn't do it. He anyway, didn't pay your but, taxes. But he gave me 150 clear, but he never <laughs> paid any of the taxes. <laughs> so anyway, uh, but I, I, uh, somehow or other we got away with it. But anyway, um, uh, I left home, right? After the ba with the baby standing now 10 weeks old. So I'm getting all the all our vast estate in order. I had, our uh, rent was about 95 bucks, and I had a $90 a month car payment. And I had a small insurance policy I was uh, paying off, and uh, so um, uh, I let, uh, did the checkbook, and I said, "Okay, hon, I'm leaving you with 119 dollars," <laughs> and uh, which is our entire estate. So uh, she says, "I'm fine," because we didn't worry about money back then. You know, you're young and love and new baby, and the hell with it. You know. So anyway, uh, I uh, I, w I went back with the band. Out, uh, I had to go to Pittsburgh. And I got out to Pittsburgh for the first job, and there's a, uh, I knew the hotel I was going to. There was a call waiting for me from Claire, my wife, uh, saying, uh, are you there yet? And I said, well, of course I'm here, yes, what, what's up? She, she said, well, you made a terrible mistake. I had to call it to, to tell you this. 
And I said, what do you mean I made a, te a terrible mistake? She said, you didn't leave me with $119. You left me with a dollar and 19 cents. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I said, oh, my God, I'll have to borrow some money from uh, the manager and send you some money. So I borrowed a hundred bucks and wired it to her, you know. And that was the way that, that second career with Woody Herman started, <laughs> in debt. <laughs> you had nowhere to go but up, I guess. <laughs> oh, absolutely. But people always think about well, you did this and you did that and you played with this band or you played yeah. with that band. That, you know, it's not like today. Like you play with Bruce Springsteen, you play with him for life. Those guys never changed jobs. Mm. We were jumping all over the place yeah. all the time. Yeah, I mean, those guys uh, stay in the same job all all, all their lives. Yeah, you know, uh -huh. why would you leave a job that pays you four four thousand million a year? <laughs> <laughs> it literally was musical but, chairs, wasn't oh, it? Oh, yes, then? sure. Yeah. I knew guys, great musicians, who would play with a band for two or three months. As soon as they learned the book, they wanted to play with another band and learn another book. Uh -huh. You know, they got tired of playing the same uh -huh. music. You know, essentially. You know, everybody said, oh, you're playing with Woody Herman, you're playing with Benny Goodman. Sure, it's, it's marvelous. The, the degree of musicianship is so much higher than the B bands, you know, that sort of thing. But uh, the uh, remuneration isn't that much higher. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the artistic satisfaction you get and like playing, but you do play the same music all the time. You know, everybody thinks that you know, when you, when you play a, a book, like Woody, for instance, didn't care if a drummer could read or not, because he figured with, uh, if he has an ear, in two weeks he could memorize the whole book and mm -hmm. there wouldn't be any problem. He'd just tell you when to stop, lay out, if you had to lay out, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, Benny Goodman never uh, knew I could read or not, I don't think. But it didn't make any difference, uh, uh, because when you were uh, with those bands, everybody thinks that uh, you know, geez, well, you get to play Four Brothers every night, and you get to play Don't Be That Way every night. Or, and I was with Benny, I never played Sing, Sing, Sing. Really? We never had that in the book, because he had the book rewritten, uh, written with, uh, all in a bebop vein. Oh, yeah? Uh, that was what that was the bebop band that he mm -hmm. had. And uh, so he had the book re rewritten. So we never played Sing, 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 because that was the old Benny Goodman. He didn't want to do that at that time. But then he started doing it again when he had his... The bands after that, right? Uh, but I never got to play that with him, and that used to be one of my big numbers in high school. And I used to play that record over and over uh -huh. and over and over. Did the people, um, your audiences, have a harder time dancing to the bebop band of of Benny Goodman? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. No, the tempos were okay. Were, were still, the, you know, uh, uh, medium dance dance. It's kind of the the musical structure. Yeah. Rather than the uh, the basic rhythm, see the basic rhythm was still a, a, a good steady four four, so people right. were dancing. You know, that uh, I think if uh, I don't think Benny would be the type that if he had a drummer that played outside too much, he would uh, he would be comfortable because he was a real strong rhythmic player himself. He was a marvelous player. Jeez, what beautiful sense of time and swing. Mm -hmm. So his he knew what he wanted in the band, you know. So esoterically, there were people who, who would say, well, that's not really bebop, it's not doing this, it's not doing that, it's not doing this. But it's, it's a, with the structure of the music more, yeah. the way the arrangements change, the voicings, and some of the brass figures and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, we were chatting before about, uh, later in your studio work, about playing straight eighth notes. Oh, and yes. Do you Hated have a, that. yeah, do, well, <laughs> do you remember when that concept started to change when the sure. music started to change. Yeah, it started to change uh, basically with the you know they called uh, Elvis the king, right? Mm -hmm. But he didn't play much rock and roll. They were all rhythm and blues and shuffles and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. You know, the king of rock and roll, but it wasn't a lot of rock and roll. Um, and bands like Harry Con uh, Harry so and so and 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 his, and and the uh, Harry Comet. No, not Harry Comet. Okay. This is the other guy. Oh, Bill Bill Haley. Bill and Haley the and the Comets. Yeah, yeah. They were like shuffly. Yeah, it was that almost, kind of thing. It wasn't that much different from yeah, the swing that's music. right. Uh, then <laughs> when the, uh, the I first started doing that, now I'll tell you how, how it was a twist, really. You know when the you know people doing this, all this stuff, chubby checker, that kind of straight eighth rhythm was the first thing that I had to play because I was doing candid camera. We had a, a fifteen piece uh, band on camera, uh, candid, uh, candid camera, 
and uh, our, uh, uh, what's his name? The, uh, Alan uh, Funt. Uh, Alan Funt. Yeah. He comes in and uh, the leader was a guy named Sid Raymond. And uh, Sid was a very accomplished arranger and conductor. And uh, so uh, he comes in and he says, hey, we have, a, we have a sequence that we can't use their music. And we want, we got to have our own music. He said, do you guys know a twist? Everybody <laughs> said, no. <laughs> a twist? What the heck is a twist? He says, it's a dance everybody does. He says, I brought a record. So they put the record on the PA and pumped it into the, to the auditorium to where the band was, right? And, and uh, you know, that's what it was. And if I couldn't memorize that in, in five seconds, I deserved to be canned, you know? So anyway, uh, uh, um, Alan Funt says to um, Sid Raymond, he says, Sid, do you think you can write something uh, the, the, uh, along those lines? And he said, sure. He said, can I have it ready by the show? He said, we'll need about 45 seconds. <laughs> so he said, sure. So he, he wrote two choruses of blues. And he said, hey, Sonny, do I have to write a part for you? I said, no, you don't have to write a part for me, Sid. I said, you're going to play like that, right? He said, yeah, that's what it's going to be. So he didn't have to write a part. So we played it on the air cold. We didn't rehearse it. Played it on the air cold, and I heard it. Next, the next week, we used to do like three in a row or two in a row, I forget which it was. Mm -hmm. And so I heard it about two weeks later. Jesus, they, they pumped that in perfect. It was mm -hmm. just per it sounded exactly like it's supposed to. Yeah. You know, and I said, I said to my wife, I said, boy, can you imagine having to play like that all the time? And that's what it came to. You played like that all the time. That's what you hear today. It's all based on that, straight mm -hmm. eights. Mm -hmm. And uh, I used to. Like I, th I think I told you about that story. Of, um, I used to listen to the radio going into a re recording date and listen to what the guys were playing and try to memorize a lot of it and to use it. But in, when I got to the recording date, because right. I wasn't playing one of those bands, and I never listened to that music anyway. Okay. And um, uh, that's how that started with me. That mm -hmm. would have been. I was at CBS for almost nine years in the 60s. Mm -hmm. So that would be in the very early 60s. Early 60s, yeah. with Chubby Check. Right yeah. yeah, early yeah. 60s. So it was like you seen the writing on the wall and... I did. did I was oh. stubborn. Uh -huh. I was very stubborn. And uh, I said, oh, it'll never happen. These guys can't play. Listen to that. They can't even play an ending. Every, every record fades out. <laughs> they have, can't even play an ending. <laughs> so none of them can play. So anybody, but everybody said, hey, Sonny, you got to get on to this, you know, some, okay. So uh, then it happens that I'm with my good friend Pee Wee Irwin, mm -hmm. and we're going out to a, playing a jazz gig out in Pennsylvania, and I'm driving, and Pee Wee and I are chatting. Now, this is not to be uh, derogatory to any specific group of people, except rock and rollers, I guess. <laughs> so anyway, we're driving, we're talking about the state of the music business, and and uh, we're talking about the the uh, inroads that uh, rock and roll has made in radio and everything. That's all you hear, you know, because this was about in the seventies. And uh, he said, I said, yeah, Jesus, Pee that's all you hear. He says, well, you have to admit one thing, Sonny, rock and roll is putting all the amateurs to work, and I never forgot that. And there are guys in rock and roll who can really play. There's no doubt about it. And I like a lot of the drummers I hear in some rock groups. I can't name one right now, but I hate the music they have to play. Mm -hmm. But I say, geez, listen to that, that kid can play. Because I know, you know, I have a, I know what drums sound like. I don't care what style it is. If you're gonna yeah. play Latin, if you're playing lousy, I'm gonna know it. But uh, some of these guys are really good, but the music, oh my God, terrible. That's only my opinion of folks. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You said that you also played um, early Muppets. You used to oh, yeah. early Muppets. Yeah, when they, they first started doing all the shows around New York, you know, the TV shows. Yeah. Uh, they came on the Gary Moore show co uh, several times, and that's where I played them. And you guys and would be in the pit? Yeah, we of? would be in the pit, and they'd have orchestrations, and then we'd just play background music. It was nothing, nothing really serious, very mm -hmm. soft, and, because they, they had to hear the explosions. I remember talking about the way they used to blow each other away yeah. when they were new. They were, they were so funny, unbelievable. And they grew up to be such an empire that I was a very, very uh, big admirer of animals, of course. Uh -huh. you know, 
And uh, actually, you know they had Buddy Rich on the show. Did you ever hear about that? Show, sure. Yeah, uh, I have a tape of that. When he played and the room, yeah. Then he played he, the he stage. Comes, he stuff. walks down to the box, plays all over the stage, yeah. and then the then the, the at the end the dialogue is they say they they bring animal up, kill, 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 <laughs> drum battle, drum <laughs> battle, kill. You know, and Buddy's looking at him. He says, "Who's this?" He says, "That's animal." He says, "He looks like an animal." He says, "You, but if I if he breaks this chain, you'll look like an animal." <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, it was fantastic. So they get up there and they, they play back and forth. And Ronnie Verrill was a drummer, an English drummer for the uh, group in, oh. in the band in uh, London. And he was a marvelous drummer. And so he's got going. And he did a good job of the syncing because they made, the, uh, you know, this frantic drumming yeah. of uh, 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 animals. And then Buddy's looking at him, and then he starts up, you know, and he starts up, and then they have these little trades back and forth. And all of a sudden, Buddy really starts letting loose, and you can see Animal's eyes, they start to get like this. His eyes go, it goes like this. And Buddy finishes, and goes, bam, 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 like this, or something, whatever. One of his great flourishes. So Animal takes the snare drum, you see, it goes like this. Bam, he throws it. The next one, it's, out, it's over Buddy's head. <laughs> <laughs> and I was the end of the show. I was, oh, that's fantastic. I love that thing. Yeah. Yeah. You have a that's copy fun. of that, you said? I do, yeah. Yeah, that is so great. Uh, it's really a fantastic thing. Uh, but the, the working with the Muppets was so much fun. You know, we got to talk to those guys. There's only two guys then mm -hmm. that we saw, anyway. And they only had two characters, you know. Yeah. One of them would get blown away. Yeah. yeah you remember that. You sure. told me. That. Yep. You're dating yourself. I you know. See. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've got a great looking wall of photographs over here, too. And who are your favorite uh, characters in your. In There's your one of them right behind you, my kid. All right. Yeah. He's a marvelous drummer. Uh huh. World class. Is he making a living at it? Oh. Yeah. He's world renowned. I know that it's not a. He's a drummer at the uh, Lion King. All oh, right. And he's uh, also one of the assistant conductors Excellent. of the show. He's much better than I ever thought of being. He's unreal. He's unreal. He's super. And if I say it, it's not because he's my kid. Yes, it is. But <laughs> it's, he's my kid, and I couldn't be prouder. He really is something. He was a straight kid all his life, and he still is. Hmm. And he's 6'6", six, six. so if I did anything, he'd knock me out. <laughs> <laughs> but he's a marvelous player, absolutely marvelous. Great. Well, I just was, um, I was wondering, when was your last studio date? Oh, my last and, studio. And was it a conscious thing, like, I'm out of this now? Uh, what happened to me with the, with the studio stuff was that, what happened to me with the studio stuff was that I, um, I would say it was in the 70s, mid-70s. I had, uh, 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 we lost our jobs at CBS, NBC, ABC, all the staff orchestras mm -hmm. except uh, NBC. NBC still had the Tonight Show. That's where Ed Shaughnessy was. They still had Johnny Carson. And they had a big band, as you know. Or don't yeah, you know? yeah, oh, sure. Oh, okay. Sure. So, uh, uh, they were the only ones who were still working. Uh, we all lost our jobs because every year the con new contract came up, they cut 20 more guys, 20 mm. more guys, 20 more guys. I got finished in 1968. Uh, I, I had nine and three quarter years at CBS. Uh, my my severance was based on nine years. They wouldn't give me the three quarter oh, of a year. <laughs> well, that's what those companies you can't the bean forget counters it. Again, oh, huh? yeah. See, that's what happened to television. Television used to be show business. Now it's situation comedies and car crashes and murders and all that kind of stuff. There's no there's no shows. They, how would they dare call such a, some program shows? It's that they're programs. They're not shows. The show is with a band and with dancers and singers and you know show people. It used to be run by show people. Mm -hmm. And then the uh, lawyers and the accountants started to take over and we all lost our jobs. And the whole thing changed. Now, CBS doesn't do a show. You do a show and sell it, sell it to CBS or NBC or whoever wants to buy it. That's the way it works yeah. now. And there's no staff musicians. That's gone. Best musician's job left is Broadway. Mm -hmm. And even now, that's shrinking, right? Uh, uh, well, they, they had to cut down some men. Yeah. yeah. I... Uh, 
I started a teach. I started teaching early in my career. I always liked to teach, and uh, I have to say it myself because you don't know, but I'm good at it. I have the right disposition, and the, the right patience and all that kind of stuff, and the right expertise. I'm very experienced, and um, I've played with the, the CBS Symphony. Mm -hmm. I had a, 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 a legitimate conductor at CBS who loved the way I played a role, and he wanted me on everything that he did. It was when there were roles on the snare drum, I was the guy. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. Every, everybody in the band would say, that's like the kiss of death, Sonny, if he likes you. <laughs> you <know? laughs> so anyway, that's just another phase. Yeah. But I did all that stuff. I'm, I'm not by any means a concert percussionist, but I was uh, exposed to all that. So mm -hmm. my teaching involves a lot of stuff. And I have a lot of guys now, beside my son, I have three other guys working on Broadway who took lessons with me. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's good for my reputation as far as the teacher goes. You know. But people don't know me as a player anymore. Nobody, and people don't, uh, really, not too many people have heard me as a t teacher anymore because mm -hmm. it's fading out. Not that many people want to study. They don't want to practice. The kids today, they want to do a game and watch TV or something and, and play a game and have instant, uh, unless somebody's really gifted, they're not going to practice. Mm. And uh, I, have a couple of, I have a couple of good guys, but most of them are just floating along, you know, for something to do, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. But, uh, uh, so I, I went, when the uh, stuff at CBS stopped in 68, uh, or it was almost 69, I had already started to build up a teaching practice in New York. So I got into that very heavily. And I, I got to the point where I was making more money teaching than I ever made playing. Mm -hmm. So I said, this is silly. So I was in a, I had a, an answering service called Radio Registry, which was a big place in New York. And they used to call me up and say, are you, Sonny, are you available, uh, uh, such and such? for an hour. And I say, for an hour? I said, no, I can't, uh, I'm not available. I go, thank you, okay. No, an hour would mean I would have to, uh, you know, bring my drum case in New York, probably put my car in at least two garages, because I'd have to teach in the morning, then go record in the afternoon, and then come back and finish my teaching, and it winds up you're not making any money. So it, uh, that's, what, that's what happened to me. They finally called me one day about something, and I said, gee, no, I can't do it. She said, she said, are you working anymore? Do you want to work? Yeah. And I said, to tell you the truth, why don't you skip me for a while? I just want to see what I'm, uh, how I do with just the teaching. And because we were in an era, there was a recession in the early 70s, and everything instead of being two hours was an hour, or um, instead of being four hours was two hours, and everything was getting cut back and all that kind of stuff. And the, Guys were really scrambling for dates. There were a lot of dates, but they didn't pay as much. Mm -hmm. And uh, musicians uh, didn't uh, share in residuals like the singers did. You right. know? We got paid once around, and then after that you got paid uh, three quarters, of, and then you got paid a half, then, you, then it went down to nothing practically. Oh. But uh, the singers got paid big time. Best thing I ever had was once in the Olympics when we were in Japan, we did a Coca-Cola commercial for four hours. That in itself was great. But then they brought the singers in and they did it in every conceivable okay. language you could think. So we got paid again for each one. Oh, I don't know, what it came to about $6,000 oh, wow. or something like that. That's about that. Like for four hours. I said, boy, I'd love, I'd love to have a, a job like that all the time, but uh -huh. no, no, no go. <laughs> so that, that was a long time ago. Yeah. Long time ago. Anyway. Yeah. Well, you've had a amazing career. It I've had a lot like of fun, there's no doubt about it. And I've enjoyed your opinions. And, and I've had, uh, I have had a lot of people help me. Yeah. A friend of yours, Bobby Rosengarten, uh -huh. helped me by hiring me at NBC, uh, getting the NBC to hire me as his sub so he could go out and make more money recording. <laughs> <laughs> Bobby was That's a great, great guy, I liked him, I yeah. always liked him. Yeah. And uh, uh, he was a boisterous kind of guy, you yeah. know, and the, yeah. uh, run around and hollering right. and screaming and all that stuff. <laughs> well, he's the, he was a much better drummer than people gave him credit for. Mm -hmm. He's been uh, up to the college a number of times, too. I beg your pardon? He's been up to the college a number oh, of sure. times. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Great. And you'll be uh, 80 in October. October. That's right. Yeah. That's, congratulations. Jeez. You look good. And uh, thank you. How long have right. you been married now? I beg your pardon? How long have you been married now? Uh, 52 years, That's I great. think it is. Yeah, sure. My little dancing darling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that great? 
Well, I want to thank you for your time. Well, it's been I, my pleasure. I hope this is. I hope I didn't hog everything. No, no, here. I got what I was after. Did Let's you? put it that way. Well, I'm glad. I think I'm you'll glad. enjoy watching it too. I'm not a. <laughs> I'm not one of those uh, cult kind of people, you no. know, as far, as far as that goes. Nothing mysterious about me. That's I don't all right. think. <laughs> all right. Thanks a lot. Okay.